Hello everyone, welcome to Linux is Scary. Linux is Scary is a presentation brought to you by Clemson ACM. We're on Steam and Freenode IRC channels. Um, my name is Robert Underwood. I will be presenting today. This presentation is normally also presented with Austin Anderson, um, the president of our organization. Now, what exactly are we going to talk about today? We're first going to start off with what exactly is Linux? this weird thing that you're hearing about in some of your classes. Then we're going to talk roughly about how the Linux file system is organized, how to use the terminal effectively, getting owned by permissions, and how to work with those, how to work from other machines, how to access your web hosting available on the people.cs.clemson.edu domain, and finally, we'll wrap up with some final suggestions. So what exactly is up with this Linux thing? Well, to give you a short history, Linux was created in 1991 by Linus Torvalds. He still manages Linux to a large extent today, and he's kind of the benevolent, benevolent dictator for life. It's written mostly in C and in assembly, and it uses a Unix-like file structure. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Um, one thing that makes Linux different than Microsoft or Apple's OS X is the Linux kernel is developed in an open source manner. What this means is you can go on the web and get a list of all of the changes and all of the source that has ever been contributed to the kernel and just look at it. And also, that means that you have the potential of contributing also. What does this mean for you? Well, it means that you get a better idea of how your operating system is actually doing things. It's really kind of a cool thing. So. With regards to what is exactly Linux, let's first step back and talk about what exactly a distribution is. A uh, distribution is kind of a flavor, so to speak, of Linux that has a few small differences. They have many similarities. Most of them have the same, well, all of them have the same kernel, but you also have other similarities like um, what tools are available, many use the Bash shell, for example, but you'll see differences in tools like desktop environment, for example, the GNOME desktop environment versus the KDE desktop environment versus the XFCE desktop environment, which is used on the lab machines. You'll see differences in what's called the package manager, which is the tool that you use to install software on a Linux computer and default applications. You'll also see some differences in behind the scenes things like, for example, up until recently, Ubuntu was using a different init system than several other Linux distributions. Um, the init system is the part of the operating system that helps start up all of the processes that are running on your machine. So what are some common distributions? So some common distributions are Ubuntu and its plethora of children including Zubuntu, Kubuntu, Elementary OS. Um, you'll also see Fedora, Debian, which is actually where Ubuntu comes from, and Arch Linux, which is another kind of child of Debian. The big thing about Arch Linux, though, is it's not really faint of, for the faint of heart. You really configure everything. Um, you'll also sometimes hear rumors of a distribution called Gentoo. Gentoo is a source-based distribution, um, very similar to Arch Linux, except for in addition to configuring everything, you also compile everything. We would not recommend either of these for people who are first-time Linux users, but Ubuntu, Fedora, probably are great choices. So who exactly is involved with Linux? Um, the biggest name would be Linus Torvalds, who's known as the creator of Linux. He's extremely passionate about what he does. Um, he comes off as abrasive sometimes in the Linux kernel developer mailing list, but what he's trying to do is make it so that the project is as best as possible. Um, and he feels that the best way that he can communicate that is by being very verbal and vocal about what exactly he wants to see or doesn't want to see within the Linux kernel. Um, people say that Linux Torvalds named his only two projects after himself, Linux and Git. Git being a term which means an pleasant person. Um, another name that you should probably be familiar with is the GNU project. GNU is a recursive acronym standing for GNU is not Unix. Um, 
Um, it's connected to many open source licensing things, such as the GNU public license, which is probably the most popular open source license that exists. Um, you'll see names like Richard Stallman is heavily involved with the GNU project, but basically they provide a layer of tool sets that exist around the Linux kernel, which allow you to do actual work on a computer. Um, the last name you might want to know about is Greg Kuro Hartman. Um, Greg KH is the developer for the Linux mainline or Linux stable branch. And the stable branch is the branch that most of you will be using kernels from. The stable branch is basically what gets maintained and used by the wide variety of people who are not directly working on the kernel development team. Um, he's kind of seen as a gatekeeper to getting patches to Torvalds, and he's generally seen as being much more pleasant to talk to than Torvalds. So we've mentioned this term kernel a couple of times, but let's kind of define some of these scarier words. So a kernel is part of Linux that interacts with your PC's hardware. Um, it's the part that tells your disk how to spin and which sections to spin to. Um, some other things you might want to be aware of are the shell, which basically is the terminal environment. So when you open up that thing that says terminal or prompt, what you see when you get there. Um, it also handles things like reading and input for commands in order to launch different programs. Um, bash is generally the shell that you will see for this or some derivation thereof. Um, one thing you may run into um, if you actually try and install Linux on your own computer would be something called Grub. Grub is what's called a bootloader, boot manager, that allows you to boot multiple operating systems or versions of the same operating system on your computer. Um, it helps initialize your system and get it into a state where the kernel and then eventually the init system can eventually start all of the other processes that need to run in your machine. One other thing that you should be very aware aware of is what's called the path variable. So path is an environmental variable. Think of it as a variable that exists above all of the other variables that your programs may use. But what it does is it defines where to look for executables when you type in a name of one on a terminal. For example, if you happen to have um, Firefox at the path user bin Firefox, if user bin is not in your path, and you just type the word Firefox, you're not going to start anything. But if user bin is in the path variable, or in the list of very list of paths in the path variable, then you would be able to load Firefox by executing the command Firefox. Some other things that you should be aware of are version control systems like Git, SVN, and Mercurial. Um, these allow you to quickly figure out what's been going on with a project and also communicate those changes across. If you're interested in more, learning more about version control systems, check out our seminar on Git. Um, Linux is actually developed using Git. It's a great tool. I use it on a daily basis. Um, you may have used the Mercurial system, the hand-in system, on Clemson when turning in assignments. On the back end, that uses the Mercurial version control system. So you can actually interact with it. And if you want to learn more about that, you should check out our Perfecting Your Projects presentation. Um, lastly, I want to talk about make and make files. Make and make files are part of what's called a build system that allow you to define rules for compiling code and doing other tasks. They're very useful, and they're probably the most common way of distributing methods of compiling a certain project to other people. So you may have heard us kind of talking about compiling and making things from source. Well, unlike Windows and Linux, you don't always get a pre-compiled executable. Now, sometimes you do, um, but when you do eventually get stuff from source, usually it'll come in a zipped archive. So what you'll do is you'll unzip the archive, usually involving something called the tar command. So tar xvf, name of file dot tarGZ. And then if it's an autos tool project, which is probably the most common of source-based projects, what you'll do is a dot slash configure. When that command completes successfully, then you'll execute the make command. And then if that works, 
that will do stuff. Then eventually you'll do sudo make install. This will install it on your system as a whole, but there are also variables like, for example, the prefix, which is a variable you can set to install it into a different location. Now, I will point out, and we'll talk about this later, that sudo will not work on the lab machines for you. You are not an administrator on the lab machines. Um, if this doesn't work, um, probably just means that it's using a different system than auto tools and usually there's a file called readme which will contain information regarding how you actually need to build the project so oftentimes though you don't have to directly compile things from source unless you're using a distribution such as Gentoo um, packaging systems are basically an easy way to find and install pre-configured packages pre-configured pieces of software for your computer uh, different distributions have their own package managers. Um, most of them require administrator access to run. The one used on Debian-based systems, including Ubuntu and the Zubuntu machines here on campus, is apt-git. Now, again, you won't be able to run these, but if you were to install, say, your own Ubuntu-based system on your machine so that you could test some things without necessarily going to the lab, these are some commands that you might want to know apt-get update updates the metadata basically the information telling your computer what software is available and what versions of those softwares are available you can use apt cache search to look for the name of a package or a package that affects a given item apt-get install allows you to install that software um, and then finally apt-get dist upgrade allows you to upgrade all of your packages to that of the next whatever the distribution's current release is. So for example, if you're on 8.2 of Debian, you could use apt-get dist upgrade to update to 8.3, for example. Basically, it updates all of the packages on your machine and gets them in sync with whatever the upstream, the people maintaining the project, are currently using. Some other packaging systems that you should probably be aware of are DNF, which stands for Dandified Yum. It's used on newer Red Hat based systems, including Fedora. Yum, which is used on older Red Hat based systems, including CentOS and also older versions of Fedora. Um, Pacman is the package manager used on Arch Linux. And RPM is the back end that is compatible with Yum and DNF. Um, there are basically two major formats. RPMs and DEBs. The RPM format is generally used with YUM and DNF. The DEB format is generally used with the APT system. So what exactly does the Linux file system contain? So a basic overall hierarchy is it's based on a one root directory, not a tree of directories, for example, like you'd see in Windows with C colon slash slash or D colon slash slash. Instead, your physical devices and important folders are all mounted to subdirectories of the root, which is called slash. Um, some important directories that you may need to be aware of are slash home, which is where your files generally will be kept, and slash home slash your username slash. Uh, some other folders just to be aware of are slash dev, which is where device nodes, things like USBs, um, your hard disk, your graphics controller, things like that are represented as files in the slash dev directory. Um, slash mount is where you generally locate the drives for actually getting files on and off of them. So for example, you plug in your USB, you would it would be listed in slash dev, but you would actually read the files out of slash mount. Um, the slash dev is gives you more underlying access, like how to read specific blocks off of the device, for example, basically sections of data on the device. Slash USR is where your local system libraries and such would be stored. Um, user share is where, like for example, the manual pages for the various software on Linux is installed. Um, you also will see slash bin and slash user bin where system executables and local executables would perhaps be installed. Um, some distributions are slightly different in how they organize and manage these folders, so it's important that you read the documentation for the particular Linux distribution that you use before trying to figure out if you can't find a given file that you expect to find. So we mentioned that things like your graphics card and 
your display and such are all files. Well, in Linux, everything is a file. Every object is a subclass of a file. Folders, links, output devices, all of these things are files. So you can read to them, you can write to them, just as if they were a file. Now, this has some very interesting effects. Um, first off, because everything is a file, um, in Linux, you don't generally use extensions. Um, file extensions basically categorize, but they don't necessarily restrict on the contents of a file. Executable could be named a.out, prog1, or even .bashrc. Um, usually files starting with a dot, like .bashrc, are what are called hidden files. You can see them by passing the dash a flag to see hidden files on the ls command. We'll talk about that more in a minute. But basically, you just normally will not see them when you're listing a directory. Um, and because of this, running a command, for example, sl or ls, is basically just running an executable file that exists within your path variable that we talked about earlier. So what exactly can you do with the terminal? Well, first, let's talk about some simple navigation commands. Sometimes you'll notice that your screen gets stuck. Um, most common reason for this is you're running some long-running program and you need to stop it. If you press Control c this will send what's called a sig interrupt signal to the computer, which will ask the process to stop. Most of the time, this will help you get out of the program that you're currently running. There are other options that you may be able to use. Um, for example, if you've locked your terminal, Control q should resume from there. The pwd command lists your present working directory which is basically where in the file system tree you're currently operating out of. So, ls basically is a tool that allows you to list the files that are in the current directory. If you use ls-l, the dash l being a flag, it gives you additional information on what files exist. Another thing you should be aware of is ls-a, which I mentioned earlier, which allows you to see files that begin with the dot, which are normally hidden from view. So, one thing that's really important to understand about Linux is there's no such concept as a trash can. When you delete things, they're gone for good. Uh, so how do you actually manipulate files? Well, the most common way you're going to do this was with the mv command. The mv command allows you to move files, which is also how you do renaming. So if you say mv original file slash path to new directory slash file name, it'll move it from the old directory to the new path, file directory path. And you can also move it, move file 1, file 2, which will change the name of file 1 to file 2. Uh, likewise, the cp command, is known for copy, allows you to copy a file from one location or another or into a file with a different name in the same directory. Lastly, rm, followed by a file, is how you delete a file off of a given directory. Again, let me emphasize, there is no trash can. Deletion is permanent. Be careful before you delete stuff. So you've heard me mention the kind of the concept of a flag. So let's explain how a command is generally structured. So generally, you have the name of the command followed by one letter flags preceded by a single hyphen, and then longer flags separated by spaces with two hyphens before them, and then followed by any required parameters that may exist. Um, so what's this lets you do, for example, is if you had the command ping-c12, what this represents is ping using the flag c, which is for the count. You can also see the equivalent version using a long st longer style flag, dash dash count equals 12. So basically flags can have arguments, but they allow you to do various things. Most programs provide a dash dash help or a dash h option for commands, which allows you to get access to some help information that, for a given program. Um, if you're looking for additional information, you can use the program called man, which will display manual pages for a given program, using the syntax man, the name of the program that you're trying to run. Many commands also provide a dash dash verbose or a dash v option to print more information. When you're, something's not going wet, right, this extra verbosity can help you get a better idea of what exactly is going on with the program that you're looking at. So let's go ahead and mention some symbols in shorthand that you'll see in programs. When you see a dot, that generally refers to the current directory. 
So a dot by itself or a dot slash says the current working directory and then some file under that directory. Two dots refers to the parent directory. So kind of using this little pattern, you can use dot dot slash dot dot, which will then refer to the grandparent directory or the parent two levels, the parent of your parent. Slash by itself refers to the root directory. All directories are children of the root directory. So if you want to search the entire disk, you could say find on slash, and then you would look over the entire directory. If you see just the tilde, that refers to your user's directory. So for example, if you were the user ACM, your home directory would be slash home slash ACM, or you could just use tilde and it would represent that material. Um, one last kind of variable that we want to mention right quick is bang bang. Um, also known as exclamation point, exclamation point. It expands to the contents of the last command that you ran. This allows you to, for example, if you forgot to run a command with administrator access, you could run it as sudo exclamation point, exclamation point, or sudo bang bang in order to run the same command again, but with administrator access this time. Again, you do not have administrator access on the Linux machines, but something worth knowing. Um, you also will see what are called terminal um, escape sequences. Most of these begin with the backslash character. You'll notice unlike a Windows-based operating system, you will use the forward slashes in paths instead of backslashes. Backslashes are instead used for what are called escape characters. These allow you to print some special characters like, for example, new lines or spaces. If you want to print an actual backslash, you can use backslash backslash which will then print the actual contents of a command. If you want to insert the contents of another command into a command that you're running, you can use dollar paren with the command paren, which will then print the output of the command, or you can put surround the command that you want to run and insert the output of, in backticks. Um, if you add an ampersand to the end of a command, it will run it in the background. Running tasks in the background is a good way, for example, if you have some long running process that you don't want to lock up your terminal, it makes it easy in order to run multiple processes off of a certain terminal window. It's a useful tool to know how to do. So let's talk about messing with output. Anything that you see appear on your terminal screen either came from standard out or C error. Um, this is the same standard out is the same stream as printf in C or C out in C++ and standard error is what you would see from the C error stream in C++ or the P error in C. Um, when you echo, use the echo command, it echoes whatever you typed in as input out to standard out. Um, another useful command related to this is cat, which allows you to print the contents of a file to standard out. You can use this in combination with other commands in order to chain them and do various different things. So how can you mess with output? Some commands like grep, which is a command that allows you to search for certain patterns within a string, or less, which allows you to kind of paginate or basically divide into page screenfuls at a time information that you're reading in from standard in. CN is what standard in is referred to in C++ or scanf, which is what you would use to access the same information in C. So for example, if you did grep pattern input file, it'll match all of the lines in input file that match pattern. Um, the pattern can be as simple as an actual word or as complicated as what is referred to as a regular expression. If you want to more, learn more about regular expressions, um, you'll find out more about them in CPSC 350, uh, which is Foundations of Computer Science, but also at some of our other seminars we'll be mentioning them because they're very useful things to know how to do. Um, less input file allows you to, if you ever see commands just scrolling by and scrolling by and scrolling by, um, using less can make it easier to read all of that information. So you heard me mention, I believe, piping. So piping is basically when you attach the standard output of command A to the standard input of command B. For example, you could pipe the output of a grep 
into another grep in order to further restrain the input and then pipe that in, into less in order to apply multiple filters and then paginate your results. This makes it easier to read them when you're seeing a bunch of output from a given command. Um, something else that's useful to know about is what's called redirection. This is where you redirect the contents that would normally go to standard in or out to another location. For example, the first example shown here, prog name greater than output file, overwrites the contents output output dot file with the output from program name. It's a useful thing to know how to do. If you still see output from that, you should be aware that there's also what's called standard error. You can redirect both standard error and standard out using the ampersand greater than. Um, you should also be aware of what's called appending. So if you use two greater than symbols, that will append the output instead of just clobbering or deleting the entire contents of the file and creating a new file. This can be useful for gathering like a long running log where you have to want to have a good idea of what exactly was done. One other thing that I will point out is what there's what's called input redirection. Sometimes in your classes you'll need to run a test script against a file that you have. So what you can use is program name less than input file will then use the contents of input file as input for the program called program name. This is a very useful tool to kind of have in your tool chain. So lastly, let's or again, let's talk about what history is, or basically how do I run what I just ran. You can use the up key in order to cycle through your previous entered commands. Alternatively, you can use control P and control N to move up and down throughout your history. You can also use the history command. The history command will print previous commands that you may have used, and if you want to find a specific one, you can use history pipe grep to search the contents of the output of history and you're looking for the pattern ls. Um, likewise you can also use control r to do what's called a reverse search on the history of your program. So for example this reverse search let's say you ran ls foobar um, if you do control r l it'll probably bring up the result of ls foobar even if you had ran several commands intermediately in the intermediate time provided none of them begin with ls. This can be a useful tool for finding a specific command that you've run in the past. Um, let's very briefly talk about shell configuration. There's a lot more that you can do here, but just to cover some basics, um, shell configuration, you can use other shells, like for example, ZSH or KSH. Um, these are more popular on other operating systems and other distributions, but basically these provide additional functions. Um, for bash, there's a file called .bashrc in the root of your home directory, which contains definitions of aliases and functions and some other things. Aliases are basically another name for another command. For example, if you don't, previously the lab machines had a command called sl, which had a steam locomotive that chugged across the screen. Well, if you wanted to disable that, you could alias the sl command to echo steam locomotive, and then it takes much less time to realize that you typed ls backwards. Um, there are tons of tutorials for how exactly you can customize your shell. We recommend you look into it, because it's really kind of an interesting subject and a great way to personalize your machine. So just some other commands that we're going to talk about very briefly. Man, I mentioned earlier, brings up an extensive man page for most of the things that you would want to know about. It includes um, header files, commands, and even itself. It's a really useful command to know how to use. SL calls, summons the steam locomotive that we talked about earlier. Touch creates a file with a given name with no contents. Um, I highly recommend you learn Vim. Vim is a text editor with a lot of power and resources, but it does have a pretty steep learning curve. Um, if you're looking for something simpler, you may try nano, which does very, nano followed by a file name, or um, pico or gedit. All of these are simpler editors than the Vim text editor, though I do strongly recommend learning Vim. If you need to download a file from the web, you can use curl lo followed by the URL to download the files to the current directory. And I mentioned tar. Tar is basically how you interact with what are called archives, basically zip files from Windows. Um, 
flags for tar are kind of arcane and don't particularly make a lot of sense. But basically think about it this way. XCF is extract the files, and CZF is create the archive. Basically, it allows you to figure out what exactly you need to do in order to access a given file. Um, there, we've attached a link to a relative, relevant XKCD comic, which kind of highlights the comedic fact that you can't really necessarily think of what a specific flag of tar does because its flags are so archaic and kind of confusing. Um, lastly, with regards to the terminals, we're going to briefly mention what's con called the concept of shell scripting. Basically, if you put commands into a file, you can run them from the shell. So you can do this, for example, by adding the what's called an octothorpe followed by an exclamation point, also referred to as a crunch bang slash bin bash to the beginning of the line, and then marking the file as executable with chmod u plus x, so user gains execute privileges on the script, and then running the script with dot slash script dot sh. We'll talk more about permissions in just a moment. As I said, we'll talk about permissions. So in Linux, permissions are broken up into users, root, and groups. So users are unique accounts. Root is the administrator account. They can do just about anything. You will not be able to access the root user account on the Clemson University machines. Um, if you need to run a single command as root, um, you can use the sudo command to do this, and then temporarily log on as root using sudo su. Again, you won't be able to do this on the Clemson machines. Um, groups are pretty much the same as users, but basically it applies to a collection of users having permissions instead of just a single user. Um, users in the sudoers group can generally use sudo. Um, sometimes it's also called the wheel or the admin group, depending on your distribution. But users can be in multiple groups, and basically any user, any particular group, will have access to the resources, provided permissions have been set appropriately. If you want more information on this, you should look at the chmod command, which, which changes permissions, and the chgroup command, which changes group ownerships, for more information. So, working from other machines. One of the easiest ways to access remote machines is with what's called SSH, or the secure shell. The Sashir shell is accessed in the following way. SSH, your username at access.cs.clemson.edu. This creates a connection from your machine to the access machines, which are basically publicly accessible machines on the Clemson network, which allows you to get into the McAdams, network, McAdams lab network. Once you're on this machine, you can then SSH to one of the different machines listed in the message of the day, for example, the Joeys or the Dragons and then you can do work on there. Um, do not try to compile anything on access if you can help it. The access machines at one point didn't even have compilation tools installed on them. So when you try to compile things on the access machines it would fail. But when you compile and do other work on these machines you're basically stressing the access point and making life much slower and much more miserable for everyone else who happens to be using the lab machines outside of campus, so try not to do it. Uh, lastly, um, you can use a virtual machine to get work done outside of campus. Um, VirtualBox is a free hypervisor, basically a tool that allows you to run virtual machines, allowing you to give a Linux environment inside of your Windows or Mac OS X um, computer. It's a very useful tool to know about. Um, on Windows, you may have heard of Sigwin. Um, I cannot recommend using Sigwin, however. Sigwin, while it provides some trimmings of a GNU slash Linux environment, it's not perfect, and the APIs that they're based off of are pretty old and unmaintained. So if you can help it, either remote into the machine in the lab using SSH, or set up a virtual machine. Ultimately, you will want to test on the machines in the lab because that's probably what your professors are going to be testing on. But if you don't want to necessarily test on the lab, even using something like SSH, just be aware that that is in fact an option. Um, so a couple last things. Um, as a Clemson student in computer science, you have web hosting space. 
um, you can change into the directory slash web slash home slash username where username would be your particular username slash public dot html um, for most users that a symbolic link basically a pointer to this location is in your home directory in a directory called public underscore html from there you can put web files generally starting with index index.html but you could have others that are located on people.cs.clemson.eu tilde your username um, when you want to serve files in this way um, you'll want to make sure to add um, read permissions to um, the use or to the files that you're serving so that others can read the files um, and then mark the directories as well as group readable so as a wrap up some final warnings never run a random command from the internet this can have very dangerous effects for example it could delete your entire hard drive um, Linux is pretty flexible and pretty powerful so if you tell it to rm dash rf so remove recursively every file that you find called on the root directory it will delete everything off your entire hard disk um, this is kind of the equivalent of deleting system 32 on a windows machine it's a very painful process but the computer will still technically let you do it if you have the permissions to do that secondly don't cheat um, professors have advanced software that can check what algorithms your program is using and determine whether or not your algorithms are particularly similar to other programs that other students have submitted. Um, changing variable names doesn't help even if you completely change the names of the variables. And professors can in fact do find people who cheat in this way pretty much every semester. So don't do it. It's not going to help you and you're not going to get away with it. Um, don't use the pseudo command on the lab machines. Um, while you do it once, you probably won't have anything happen to you. But if you do it repeatedly, it actually sends an email every single time you use it to the system administrators for the Linux machines here in Academies. If you want something installed and it's not installed, instead of using the sudo command, send an email to ithelp at clemson.edu, put school of computing in the subject line, and that will get you in contact with the appropriate people that can make the decision about what to install. Lastly, let's talk briefly about the snapshot system. So at Clemson, and this is pretty much unique to Clemson, so don't rely on it, there are directories known as the snapshot directories. These are hidden directories in your root directory which contain backups of all of your files kept hourly, nightly, and weekly. Um, this can be particularly useful if you accidentally overwrite a project at 2 a.m. the day before it's due. Um, so if you happen to delete something, can be particularly useful. Some other resources that we'd like to point you towards is the cheat sheet that we distributed along with this presentation can be found in the link right here, as well as um, we want to let you know about a site called Explain Shell, which will give you output of a command and tell you, based off the contents of a command, it'll tell you roughly what it does using the manual pages that are available for it. Um, lastly, um, we want to make you aware of the computer science administration staff. Um, most of them are found in the main hall um, in McAdams. Um, talk to them. They're generally pretty friendly and they can help answer some of the questions that you may have. Uh, that said, at this time we'll take any questions. Thank you for your time.